Awesome, thank you, Ben. So tonight I'm just gonna quickly go over the agenda. So we're gonna have John Sweeney talking at, well, right after this at 6.40 about Emerald Ash Borer, and then at 7.15 we'll have the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council speaking. And then at 7.50 I'll end it up with the Ken Limbicasis Watershed Restoration talk and the efforts that we're doing within the watershed. And after each presentation, we will have a question period for about 10 minutes. So you can use the chat function, which if anyone is unfamiliar with Teams, it's along the upper bar. It's the little like um, speech bubble. If you press that, you can see where you can start typing as well as everyone else's comments. And I will read the everyone's comments questions there and if there is a question that you think you like the most that you would like to hear someone answer if you give it the thumbs up then I'll know which questions are the most favorable questions if we run out of time for the 10 minute question period. So I'm going to hand it off to John Sweeney but quickly John Sweeney is a research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service at the Atlantic Forestry Centre in Fredericton and he'll be speaking about emerald ash borer today. So John, if you want to go ahead and share your screen and unmute yourself if that works. Just give him a moment here. And technology is always great when it's working right. John was in the chat. I don't see him anymore. He was probably having some difficulties connecting. So I'm just going to reach out to him real quickly. So John's having a little trouble here, so I was wondering maybe if Kristen, if maybe you guys could hop in and we'll switch the arrangement of the agenda a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of a feedback, so I'm not sure if um, do you have two monitors going by any chance? I do. Yes, I'll, um, I'll mute if you just mute one of them. They, that should be fine. Awesome. Um, OK, and I will. Um, try and share my screen and hopefully I share the right one. OK, let's see. Are you guys seeing like the main presentation view and not my look? Perfect. Oh, that's one of the first times this has worked out like that. All right. <laughs> Um, so hello everybody. My name is Kristen Elson and I am the program director for the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council. Um, tonight I also have Claire Ferguson with me as well. She's new to our team, but um, she helped me put the presentation together. She's our outreach and communications coordinator. Um, 
so you might hear from her as well or if you have any questions after you can always reach out to her um, but tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about um, invasive species, a little bit of background around what they are, um, but then more specifically we're going to do a little bit of a dive down into some of the terrestrial species that we are concerned with um, and some of the ones that we in particular would like the residents and those working in the Kennebecasis watershed to be aware of. Um, so if there are questions feel free to pop them in the chat um, or raise your hand and mute yourself and I can try and answer along the way. Um, but we'll just start right in. So just a little bit of background on who we are. Um, we are a council that is made up of various different stakeholders from government, non-government, um, land conservation groups, watershed groups, um, academia, researchers, everyone who um, is interested in dealing with invasive species or wants to see management of invasive species in our province move forward. Um, so our mission is to protect the province's environmental, economic, and recreational interests from the threat of invasive species. So we are looking at it not just from an environmental lens, but also um, from an economic and a recreational, which I'll talk a little bit about in, in a bit. So how we do this though, a um, couple you know, main pillars that we work on. One is trying to enable and promote collaboration amongst the groups doing work in the province, connecting people, um, making sure we're using our you know, resources as efficiently, helping each other out where we can so that we're not doubling up on the, on the work, um, providing leadership and knowledge um, on different invasive species issues, different management techniques, trying to kind of be that central hub, um, connecting everybody rather than everybody going out and doing all the work individually um, you know we don't want to double up everything and make everyone do triple the amount of work um, and then we also want to engage enable and empower citizens to take action um, and take action we mean by there's steps that people can take to actually prevent spreading invasive species to help um, deal with this problem of invasive species um, and again I will get into those a little bit later so first off the bat is what are invasive species? Um, we had a little bit of an introduction at the beginning, which was great. Um, so we do tend to use um, this kind of three criteria to help us kind of nail down what an invasive species is. One is that it has to be a non-native species, meaning it didn't um, evolve here. It's not naturally found in this area. Um, and that could be, you know, native to, um, you know, it might be that it's not, present in New Brunswick, but it is present somewhere else in Canada. Um, it could mean it's from, you know, another part of the continent. It could mean it's from another, a completely different continent. Um, and this, so the scale of native can kind of depend. Um, the other criteria is that it spreads rapidly. So that means that the once the species gets here, um, it's really hard to get rid of. It's, it either has really quick reproduction or um, it really gets its roots in or it, it uh, takes over really swiftly and it's hard to uh, to manage. Um, and then the third criteria is that it's harmful in some way. So that could be harmful to the environment. Um, it could be harmful to the economy. So it you know has an impact on industry or it could be harmful to people and that it could, you know, uh, could actually pose a human health risk. Um, so for something to be considered invasive, we wanted to check off all three of these boxes, non-native, spreading rapidly, and then harmful in some way. So I have a little bit of a, a illustration, a couple different species to kind of um, get at the, the differences that we're talking about here. So the first one um, is a species that some of you might be really familiar with, leaves of three, let it be. This is poison ivy. Um, and if any of you have had a run in with it, you might know that it's uh, can be harmful, can cause a, a human health impact. Um, but that being said, it is not considered an invasive species. Is it one that we might not be happy that it's here? Yes, but poison ivy is a native species. Um, so it, it did evolve here. It is kind of in balance with the rest of the ecosystem and you're never going to see poison ivy completely take over a forest floor and push out all the other species. So despite the fact that we're not a big fan of it, it is not considered an invasive species. Now on the flip side of that, we've got tomatoes. So tomatoes are not native to uh, North America. They were uh, brought over long, long time ago, colonialism, and anybody who knows um, they've tried to grow a garden, it, you do have to take lots of good care of them. So even though they're not native to this area, um, you're never going to have, you know, 
tomatoes escape the garden and take over, you know, other areas, right? Because they need really specific conditions. I myself have to try really hard to make them successful, let alone, you know, have them escape and, and run amok. So even though they're not native to this area, tomatoes wouldn't be considered an invasive species. We would just call that a non-native species. So that is also not invasive. The next one some of you might be familiar with or becoming more familiar with are wild turkeys. Um, so turkeys are an interesting case because they are not native to New Brunswick. Our climate has typically been a little too harsh for them, um, but we are seeing populations from Maine um, migrating up into North or into into New Brunswick and succeeding. Um, so the question around this, uh, whether or not they're going to have an impact, um, we, you know, whether we consider them invasive is kind of still up in the air. Um, you know, they aren't from here, but are they going to have a negative impact? We're not quite sure. The jury's still out. Um, if you, you know, if you love turkeys and you want to hunt them, you might not consider you, you, them invasive because you actually like them. You want to see them here. Um, but if you're somebody who, you know, has a vendetta against these turkeys, maybe they they come in and tear up your lawn looking for bugs and all that kind of stuff, then you're um, you wouldn't like them and you might consider them invasive. So there is kind of a societal label that we put on certain species um, to that dictates how we kind of impact uh, and view them. So this jury's still out. The one that is absolutely considered invasive across the board are these little guys. So I'm talking about the tiny, tiny little mussels. These are the zebra mussels um, that you may have heard of that have taken over the Great Lakes and other parts of North America. Um, these are, um, are actually growing on a native mussel. That's an actual native mussel underneath. Um, and this is about as big as they get. But they colonize in such high numbers, they clog pipes, they completely alter ecosystem dynamics, cause cost billions and billions of dollars um, to try and manage them since they invaded in the late 1980s. Um, so they definitely cause harm to the environment, um, to the economy and people. They're very sharp. I myself have stepped on a few and they'll definitely slice your foot open. Um, they spread and colonize in astronomical numbers. It's about 700,000 per square meter, um, and they are not native. They're actually they're native to the the Eurasian um, area, the Black and Caspian Seas. So they check all the boxes and are 100% invasive. Now this one is a bit of a tricky one. This is cyanobacteria. Some people might know it as blue green algae. It's not algae. It is a bacteria. Um, but a lot of people will say that this is invasive. It certainly causes some um, some damage, some human health impacts, um, you know, water quality impacts. We're seeing it pop up more and more in places. Um, but cyanobacteria is not invasive. Cyanobacteria um, and the type that causes the, the toxin that we're worried about here in New Brunswick is native to the area. The reason we're seeing it is simply because, well, not simply, but is because um, the conditions are more conducive. So we're having warming waters, our climate's changing, and because of that we're seeing uh, populations pop up. But it's always there, um, we're just seeing more of it. So is it a problem? Yes, but cyanobacteria is not an invasive species problem. So with that little primer, um, we're going to go into some of the impacts of invasive species. So the first one that people often think about is those environmental impacts, and we kind of categorize these in three different um, ways. One is that they increase predation of, of native species, um, or they alter predator-prey dynamics, which can be particularly troublesome for species at risk. Um, so here we've got a picture of, I believe that is, trying to do my, I think it's a largemouth bass, um, but I'm, my ID is not great. Um, feeding on another, I think that's a trout. Um, we've got good old fluffy here. Cats can be considered invasive in some places. Um, on the far right, we've got uh, lionfish and two very confused sharks. <laughs> um, this is a fish that invaded the Caribbean after a bunch were released off the coast of Florida. Um, and they've completely taken over. One of the reasons is thought to be that they don't look anything like any other fish in the Caribbean. So predators who can eat them, which there are few because they do have spiny uh, tox toxic spines, don't actually realize that they're food because they don't look like anything. Um, so we have an increase in predation. We've got uh, changes in the food web. A lot of the times these invasive species will compete with our native species for food and space. So this is an example in this photo here of garlic mustard, which is um, uh, an ephemeral plant um, that takes over forest floors. Um, 
and you can see there it's just completely carpeting the forest floor, no room for any other uh, ground level vegetation. And then they can invasive species can also bring new diseases. So some of you may have heard of white nose syndrome, um, which is affecting our bat populations. We've lost about 90% of our bats in, in the Maritimes um, due to this disease. And it's actually caused by an invasive fungus that is thought to have been brought here um, or spread through contaminated equipment that has gone from caves to caves. So those are some of the environmental impacts. Um, but we also see impacts to um, as I mentioned, the environment, or sorry, the economy, our recreation, human health, um, and we can kind of group these into to a couple different categories. One is the decreased ecosystem services, and that's just a big fancy way of saying, you know, things that the environment does for us. So think of shade that's provided by trees in a city, which helps regulate temperature and cool things in the summer. Um, flood mitigation that's provided by wetlands. We're all very familiar with, you know, the impacts of flooding in, in this province, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, wetlands are, are this environmental sponge that helps protect us from flooding. What happens is, is when invasive species come in, if they alter that environment um, to a certain degree, all of a sudden that environment can actually act in the same way it used to and it can't provide those ecosystem services. So, you know, for example, a, an animal, a pest comes in and, and takes out all the trees in an area. You're going to have hotter, you know, ground temperatures. You're going to have less wind protection. If you've got a plant that comes into a wetland and completely changes the composition of the plants in that wetland and those plants can't absorb as much water, well, now your wetland can't absorb as much water and you're going to be more pl prone to flooding. So that's decreased ecosystem services and, and the interactions that happen there are, are very plentiful. Um, the other impacts to infrastructure, these are examples of zebra and quagga mussels completely covering this, this boat. So we've got biofouling happening there. Human health impacts, there's that picture I mentioned of those zebra mussels. This is a, an example of a burn from um, a giant hogweed, which is a, a phytotoxic um, sap that comes from this plant and then impacts to recreation. So, you know, sometimes a species comes in and completely changes an area like our lakes, which is an area where, you know, unfortunately we're seeing some of this happen in the Kennebecasis with Eurasian water milfoil where you can't get a paddle through in some places because, you know, the species has come in completely colonized. So why don't we just get rid of these species? We all agree that they're bad. Um, unfortunately, it kind of has to do with timing. This is the invasion curve and this actually refers to um, we talk about how much area is infested, the amount of time that goes by and how much it costs to control it. And as you can see here, um, from the point when something is introduced, um, normally it's not detected right away. So the population grows a little bit. Once it's detected for the first time, that's usually, you know, not detected on a wide scale. It's a researcher knows about it or, um, you know, if it's the kind of the first um, warning sign that it's there. If something is done right then and there, there's a big effort to deal with it, um, you can get rid of that species. We talk about eradication, but unfortunately, usually that's not the case. Um, so the problem continues to grow, the population continues to grow and spread. And then what happens is, is it spreads to a point where the public starts to notice because they're seeing those impacts. For example, all the trees all of a sudden are dying around them. And that's when we get these calls to action to actually do something. Unfortunately though, by that time, Usually the species has already spread far enough and the population has taken so much a, a hold that um, you're really not likely going to get rid of it, you know, in its entirety, you can only manage it. Um, so this is just a very throwback um, reference, but resistance is usually futile once you get to that point. So basically what this comes down to is that it's much more efficient and much more likely that you'll be successful if we target our efforts to preventing these species from getting here in the first place than it is to deal with them once they've arrived. Um, because once they've arrived, it can be labor intensive, it can be time consuming, it's costly. Um, and as I said, the results are kind of mixed on, on if you are actually able to get rid of something. Um, this is just a photo of Japanese knotweed, which some of you also might be familiar with. You can see there that um, that has spread to a point where this poor lady's backyard is no longer a backyard. Um, all right. So if we are trying to deal with them before they get here, we have to ask ourselves, how did they spread? How did they actually get here in the first place? So we talk about pathways of invasion and there's two different kind of categories. The first, natural spread. These are things that are going to happen no matter what. 
people do. So, you know, things floating downstream, animals moving by themselves, um, or, you know, birds eating a berry and then pooping it out, a, you know, a couple kilometers away, parasit excuse me, parasitic relationships, that kind of thing. The other side of the coin, though, is human activity. These are things like planting invasive plants in our garden without knowing it, um, introducing um, a new species for food or for sport, releasing unwanted pets, the list goes on. We've got, you know, hitching rides on um, boats or um, seeds getting stuck to our boots, bugs hitching a ride on firewood. You could go on and on and on about the ways that invasive species move with people. And the problem is that invasive species are able to move much further and much faster with people than they could naturally, which is why we see the spread happen a lot faster and jumping these areas that we, they wouldn't be able to um, at their own timeline. So we figure out, OK, these are how they're moving. What do we do about it? Um, and that's where it comes down to that engaging citizens and kind of taking that personal ownership towards, you know, this collective goal. So there's a couple things we've um, have a couple different programs that we've worked with um, the Canadian Council on Invasive Species um, and some other jurisdictions in the US have used, used similar ones. So you might have come across these, um, but these are our behavioral change campaigns and they're really focused at letting people know what action they can tap, what tangible steps can they do while they're outside engaging in activities um, that can help them reduce the chance that they're accidentally bringing along a hitchhiker. Um, so tonight we're going to focus on some of the terrestrial ones and then tomorrow if you stick around or come back for that, we'll talk about the aquatic. Um, but I did want to talk about these three. Um, so the first is Play Clean Go. So Play Clean Go is our program that is aimed at encouraging New Brunswickers to um, stop the spread of terrestrial species, usually plants, but it can be pathogens, um, you know, fungi, little bugs here and there in the soil and that kind of thing, um, as they can sometimes get stuck uh, in the treads of our tires, our, our uh, boots, they can hitchhike on our equipment, um, ATVs, bikes, that kind of thing. So this is a program that was originally launched in 2012 down in Minnesota that has been adopted by the Canadian Council here in Canada. So we're starting to kind of hit the ground with this one. Um, so basically the name kind of says it all. What you do is you want to play. So you're out in nature, engaging in re outdoor recreation. Before you move to your next site, we want you to clean off your equipment and then go. Go on to your next site. So play, clean, go. The other way is kind of a little bit more detail what you can do um, if you're out hiking or as I said on your bike, ATV, walking your dog, making sure you're getting rid of that debris, anything that could be um, sticking along with you. So brushing off your footwear when you come off a trail. Um, we've started installing some of boot brush stations. You can see in the bottom left here, this is an example where there's a, a sign and we've actually anchored a boot brush down there so people can brush off their um, boots before and after they hit the trail. Um, and I will say that this seeds do stick around with you because once I was out on a um, field course in university out in Alberta, um, we were hiking at the end of the trip. My boots were wet, threw them in a plastic bag, flew home to Ontario. Being, you know, 19, I didn't unpack my bag when I should have through finally did through the boots in the in the cupboard without unpacking them. And then about a month and a half later, I went to use them again, took them out and there were shoots of flowers and grass growing out of my the laces um, from my boots. So that was kind of a first aha moment for me. Um, it makes total sense that that could have happened, but it didn't really click until it actually, you know, I saw it firsthand. So what we're trying to do with these programs to try and get people to think about it before stuff like that happens to minimize accidentally bringing stuff around. So what you can also do, um, as I mentioned, anything with tires, check for you want to get all the as much mud, you know, plant fragments you can get off there. Um, and even your dog, everybody has come brought their dog out of the bush covered in, in seeds. Just throw a brush in the car so that you can brush off your dog before they play clean go as well. So a couple of the species that we're targeting um, with this in our area. So one is garlic mustard, as I mentioned. We have a little bit of this in the province in some places, um, but you know, there's places like Ontario. It is everywhere. Um, I grew up in Ontario. I should have known this was invasive because I, I just saw it everywhere. Um, but it, it absolutely does just take over the forest floor like that. Um, 
And unfortunately, what happens is there's no space for other spring ephemerals to go in there, your trilliums, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it also is uh, allelopathic, which means that it actually puts out a, a chemical into the ground that prohibits some of the other plants from, from being successful and growing there. Um, and it's a perennial, or sorry, a biennial. So it starts off as a tiny little rosette in its first really low to the ground in its first year. And then the second year, it, it sprouts up these, um, these tiny little white flowers, which are notorious for sticking to things. Another species that we're asking people to play clean go to prevent spreading is Phragmites australis. Um, this is a, an invasive reed. It's a tall grass that you might see along roadways or, or near wetlands. Um, and this has a tendency to spread when a piece of its rhizome or the underground root gets um, kind of broken off and then falls off somewhere, say it's stuck on an ATV tire um, and then it falls off, you know, 10 kilometers down the road, that root will grow a new plant. Um, another one, LDD moth, people used to refer to it as gypsy moth, but we've moved away from calling it that. Um, even though this is a, a, what we call a forest pest um, and that, you know, the moths themselves and the caterpillars eat away at the leaves, one of the things that connects it to play clean go is that they will lay their egg masses, which is this brown fuzzy little thing, looks like a sponge behind the, the moth, on anything. Camp tents, the ins I've seen one of them on the inside of a car, like the wheel well of a car, um, patio furniture. So, you know, making sure that when you're camping or wherever you are, that you're making sure you're checking that equipment for any hitchhikers. Um, and then white nose syndrome is the other one I mentioned. Um, the, that fungus that causes white nose syndrome is thought to have originally arrived on contaminated equipment. So somebody went into a cave where the fungus was present, um, where it was native and therefore kind of in balance and didn't cause a problem, got stuff on their equipment. And then when they came to a new site, which I believe is pinpointed fairly closely in um, New York, it would have transferred into that area where it wasn't native, was able to take hold because nothing kept it in check, and it since then has been wiping out bat populations across the continent. Okay, so the next one, I know I'm running quite low on time, we've got buy local, burn local, and this is one that um, John will talk uh, a little bit about um, in terms of the species that we're focusing on, but this is very much aimed at not moving firewood. Um, so what we mean by this is that we want people to buy their wood as close to where they're going to burn it as possible. We want to minimize the amount of distance that this wood is traveling because it's very hard to identify when you have infested wood. Um, and it's very hard for the average person to, you know, to be able to look at a pile of wood and say what species it is so that they could safely say that they can move it. So we say all firewood, buy it as close to where you can, or you're planning to burn it. Um, so if you are, um, say you're getting a cord of wood for the winter or something like that, ask the supplier where they source their wood from. Um, it should be noted that there are regulations in New Brunswick about where firewood can and can't be transported to. Um, if you're camping, check ahead, follow the guidelines of your national or provincial park. Some national parks don't allow you to bring any outside wood in. You have to buy the wood there. A lot of people think this is a money grab, but it's actually to prevent any potential contaminated wood from showing up into those forests in order to protect them, um, which is why people want to go there, right? So um, the reason why they're asking you, you know, make sure you're buying the wood at the campgrounds is to do the forest a service. Um, if you do have to travel with firewood, make sure you are purchasing um, kiln dried firewood or certified uh, pest free fire, which we are able to find at hardware stores, Canadian Tire, that kind of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And a couple of the species um, that we're really you know, worried about here in New Brunswick, the first is emerald ash borer, which some of you may have heard of. This is a tiny, tiny green beetle that kills up to 99% of ash trees in an area when it arrives. We do have it here in New Brunswick, unfortunately. Um, we 2018 was the first sighting. Um, we now have it in Edmonston, Fredericton, Oromocto, and Moncton. Um, and the bottom photo here is actually an example of uh, a three year time difference of a street that was all ash trees that was infested by emerald ash borer. The other one is hemlock woolly adelgid, which um, is a tiny little uh, aphid like creature that um, comes in and it specifically attacks hemlock trees. It's present in Nova Scotia um, and we are very much 
crossing our fingers that it does not arrive here in New Brunswick. Um, but these are two species that are known to spread through the transport of firewood. So as a blanket rule, if nobody moves the firewood, then these species don't have a way of getting here. And that's what we want. So just to wrap up, we have our, our last one, which is don't let it loose. Um, and this is actually about trying to get people not to do something. Um, and that is please don't release any your, your pets, your aquarium contents, farm animals, anything like that. And also take steps to prevent, you know, those accidental escapees. Um, because unfortunately, a lot of the species that we have problems with in the wild now invasive species originally escaped and started colonizing um, as released pets. For example, those lionfish I mentioned earlier. So a couple of examples that we're targeting uh, with this program include the red-eared slider, everyone's little pet turtle that starts off nice and tiny, uh, but grows to be quite large and lives a very long time and is very dirty. Um, a lot of times people are releasing these into our wetlands where they compete with our, our native species um, of turtle, including our species at risk, like the wood turtle. They can spread diseases, they compete for, for resources. Um, rabbits, pet rabbits are another one. Um, there's a surprising number of rabbits that get found and are then up, put up for adoption um, because people are releasing them or just they escape and then they don't bother trying to track them down. Again, they can introduce um, diseases, um, they can, you know, alter those predator predator prey dynamics in an area. Um, wild turkeys are on this because as I said, jury's still out, we're not sure. Um, and unfortunately, we do have populations in the province where um, it is thought that they have been intentionally released into that area. For example, they're not, you know, along the main border. They're actually in random spots throughout throughout the province, um, further away, and that they do genetic sampling. And there's, you know, slight differences in the genetics of wild turkeys, and they're able to tell that these are not of the same population. So people are releasing these species in order to to hunt them. Um, and the same goes with wild pigs. Wild pigs are becoming a huge problem across Canada and the US. Um, they cause astronomical damage to um, to to the environment in terms, you know, they just get in, they uproot everything. They have voracious appetites. They're very intelligent. Um, but another huge concern is that they they are huge risk to the um, agricultural um, and, and the pork industry because they're able to transmit disease from wild populations to uh, to domestic pigs. Um, and then also the increase in in um, uh, contact between invasive mammals um, and people. Uh, there's also increased chances for for disease vector transmission. Um, so we ask people that if you you know before you get a new pet, before you you know get a new plant, make sure that you're learning about that species. You understand what it takes to care for it, its lifespan, all those kind of things. So you know what you're getting yourself into. And then if you can no longer care for it, um, making sure that you're reaching out to family and friends or um, the humane society, local aquarium community, farming community to see if you can rehome them. The other note here is that it's not just about the invasive species. A lot of animals, domestic animals that get released, have no idea what they're doing um, and usually end up starving to death, which is just not humane for them either. So the last thing I want to just throw out there is a plug. We would really, really appreciate if everybody who sees invasive species could help us collect data on them. So we're really pushing our citizen science, um, which is basically anybody can contribute to. So we have a project on iNaturalist, which is a really easy platform for people to use, um, where you can go upload a photo. If you know what the species is, you can put that in. If not, it'll give you some options. Um, and then that enables us to get a better sense of where invasive species are, what invasive species are here, and how big the problem is. Because um, in order to solve the problem, we need to understand it. So better data will help us with better management. Um, and that being said, there are a few species that if you were to see them, we would ask you to go straight to the big guns. Um, so for example, if you see zebra mussels or quagga mussels anywhere in your water bodies, um, or Asian carp, uh, please contact DFO. Um, or you can get in touch with us directly and we'll get you to, to the right person. But we are open if anybody wants to ask us questions or, or send us information or photos of things they're not sure of, we can help you identify and direct you to the right spot. So I know I ran over, I apologize about that, but um, if anybody has questions later on, feel free to email me or, or get in touch, or I can take them now if we have extra time. Thank you so much, Kristen. I'm actually going to unmute everyone. So if you had a question, you can just put your hand up and then 
Kristen will answer some of your guys' questions. I think that'll make it easier and a more fluent communication style. And if anyone hasn't used Teams, there's a little mic button that you can press on the top right corner to unmute yourself. If there are no questions, I just assume that I, I explained everything perfectly. <laughs> I do see a hand up there, guys. Uh, Marguerite Burns, if you want to unmute yourself um, and ask your question, or you can type it in the in the chat. Oh, maybe she just put her hand down. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I tr okay. was trying to, to type it in the chat myself, but um, I came on a little bit late, and my question was only because um, I was on another webinar about the white nose syndrome, by the way, of the bats. So, <laughs> so I wanted to know if this material will be available for me to um, review after joining late. Um, so we have taken a recording of this webinar that we will be posting. So if you'd like, you can find the link eventually through our Facebook page at Cannabicasis River. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, if we have no further questions, I see that John has joined the conversation, so I will hand it over to John, our EAB expert, and thank you again, Kristen, for coming and for starting this amazing information about invasive species. Oh, you're welcome. Like I said, any questions, just email us um, and we'll happy to answer those. Okay, so hi, it's, uh, really sorry. I, I stepped away from my computer at supper time and then completely forgot about the meeting tonight, but I did, <clears throat> I, have, I didn't forget that I was doing it. I mean, earlier today I knew about it, so I I'm, I don't have my camera on here, but I'll, I will, um, if you're, uh, I just apologize for disrupting this stuff, but I, now what do I have to do to share my screen again? I'm sorry here. Uh, so sharing your screen is, is just, it's right beside the leave button. It has a little up arrow. Okay. All right. I see it there. Okay. <clears throat> um, let me just get my PowerPoint there so I can see it on my screen. Um, it's maybe just going to move things around here because I, I've, I'm on my, I've got two screens open here. I can't see it. Oh, darn it. I mean, let me just hmm. try this again. Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. I see the uh, now. Can you see anything there? Laura? Yeah, we can Laura? see your screen. You can see the OK. All right. I will go. And is it filling the if whole you thing just now? Um. We have your notes slide rather than the presentation, so you might have to swap them around. Okay, let me just uh, I have to. Sorry about this. Oh, that's all right. I have. If, I was it. just. Gonna, it's Kristen here. If you go back into display settings, you can usually just switch the screen right then and there from where you just were. So up at the top there, display settings. Um, yep. So is it still showing the? Yeah. It's still showing the other one. Okay. So if you say swap presenter, you should be good. There you go. OK, great. Thanks very much for that tip. You're OK, welcome. and yeah, so sorry, you guys, for uh, forgetting everything. So I'll talk a bit about now about Emerald Ash Borer, a bit about its biology, uh, the impact it's having, and how to survey for it, and some of the management control options. So this is a joint presentation with uh, slides from Ron Neville from CFIA. I got some updated information from him just yesterday, and Chris McQuarrie. Um, with Canadian Forest Service in Sault Ste. Marie, who gave me the updated information on the biocontrol releases. There is our emerald ash borer, the adult and the larva. I'm sure most of you have seen it before. Um, I don't know if uh, who all is listening, if maybe if there's people out there that are totally unfamiliar with it, but I'll cover all that. So it is native to Asia. Here's a picture of uh, China and the Russian Far East, Korea, Japan. That's where it normally lives. <clears throat> And uh, over there in Asia, 
it's quite common. You can find trees that are attacked, ash trees, Manchurian ash trees that are attacked by emerald ash borer, and the tree is normally able to defend itself and just zone off the wound. And there's a picture there on the right there of where an EAB attacked this Manchurian ash. That's the same tree from far away on the left. And it looks fine. It's got a healthy crown. It's not a big deal because those trees have evolved, co-evolved defenses, and they know how to defend themselves against little AB larvae that are trying to, you know, establish themselves in the cadmium. So most of them don't establish, and the ones that do probably later die. They get the moon's response. The, the situation is different, of course, as we know here in North America, because over here we have naive hosts, trees, ash trees in the same genera, in the ash genera, but they don't have, they're not as able to defend themselves against the emerald ash borer. This is a picture of a bunch of nice ash in Toledo, Ohio in June 2006. And three years later, those trees were, were dead. And that's about how fast it can. When the populations get really high, it can kill trees in, in a couple of years. This is the distribution of emerald ash borer in the states. All of those states with red dots have it, so it's all the way up. Um, you can see in Canada, it's in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, and all the way to Halifax here on this side. Um, so what does it do? Well, it infests all species of North American ash trees. Some are more susceptible than others, whether they're healthy trees or if they've been stressed, you know, drought stressed or whatever, whether they're little nursery stock or whether they're mature trees. And they usually die in one to four years after becoming infested. Generally, once the EAB... The story in most places, once it gets there, after about 10 years, most of the ash trees in that area are dead. The good news is they have found in some of the areas that were first infested back in Michigan and that in, in 2000, early 2000s, they are finding some surviving ash trees and they're trying to get those into breeding programs to see if they truly are resistant. So that's a bit of good news, silver lining on that pretty dark cloud. Um, it costs a lot to... Um, manage EAB because you're, especially if you're just removing and replacing ash trees in cities. Of course, there's uh, the indigenous, especially Mi'kmaq and, and Maliseet, they use black ash to make baskets, and that's a, both a cultural and an economic impact there for EAB and the black ash, so they're very concerned about that. And there's ecological impacts, of course, because for one, you, you know, ash as a genus is hit very hard now in North America. So the abundance of ash is greatly decreasing and species that are dependent on ash are going down at the same time. What also happens is when you get a lot of ash kill, if it's been an ash semi-dominant stand in those gaps, in certain places, you're getting invasive species coming in, invasive plants. So green ash and black ash are highly susceptible. White ash and blue ash are intermediate to low susceptibility. Blue ash is almost in the same order as Manchurian ash. It has a one year or a two year life cycle, depending on where you are and depending on how healthy your trees are. So generally the one year life cycle is around June, you get adults emerging, they'll emerge from between June and early September. They have to feed on foliage to sexually mature. They'll do that for 10 days to two weeks. And then the females will start laying eggs in little bark crevices on the bowl of the tree or up on the branch. They usually start up in the crown of the tree in the small branches. And then as the infestation grows in that tree, that are moved down into the main stem. The larvae have this typical shape here. They make these typical serpentine galleries back and forth. That's one way to tell the eventually these, when you have enough larvae, they eat all of that phloem, all of the tissue that takes the goodies from the, the crown of the tree down to the roots, moves the food around on the tree that's eaten up. So the tree's girdled and it can't feed itself anymore. In uh, the fall, the you have this weird shaped larvae that bends back in itself. That's the mature larva. It overwinters in that stage. Or if it's a two year life cycle area, say it's really cold, it'll, it'll only make it to a certain, you know, an immature larval stage and overwinter that way. And then next spring, if it's overwintered as a mature larva, it'll pupate and emerge in the one year life cycle. Um, if you're lucky, you can see these D shaped exit holes when the adults emerge, because the adults are kind of D-shaped in profile. Okay, so EAB, it can spread on its own. Like I say, the adults are strong flyers. They can fly, uh, if you put them on a flight mill, they can probably fly 15 kilometers easily. They don't do that in real life because they're usually looking for a host tree and a mate. 
but most of the spread that you've seen um, that's happened across the U.S. and into Canada is because people have been moving infested material like firewood or nursery stock. This is a picture of the regulated area in Canada from CFIA. All of these yellow patches there, that is considered the regulated area. So there's a spot in Manitoba, one in Thunder Bay, all across southern Ontario and Quebec, most of New Brunswick, and then Halifax Regional Municipality in Nova Scotia. What that means is you can move any ash products around within those yellow areas, but you can't, and you can move things around outside of those from non-regulated, you know, areas into regulated areas, but you can't move things from the yellow spots outside the areas unless you have movement certificate. And that's those are things like, you know, ash bolts, firewood, um, ash bark, chips, wood packaging with ash in it, and firewood. So how do you survey for it? Well, there's a few different methods. One of them that was developed by uh, Krista Ryle and others at, in Sault Ste. Marie with the Canadian Forest Service is you you cut a couple of branches from your trees. If you want to actually delimit where the infestation is, you cut a couple of branches and you use draw knives to thinly, not like in this picture, that's very, that's not so thin, but very thin layers of bark and you look for the galleries of the larvae. That is, um, that's proven, that was the first way they discovered it in Quebec City. And it's a good way of kind of delimiting where your infestation is. Because when you just look at the tree from the outside, you can't tell, you could have a asymptomatic infested tree. The more common way for surveying for it, which is done by CFA and a lot of the cities, and that is to use a pheromone baited trap. This is a, this one is a green sticky prism trap. There's sticky on the outside. There's a pheromone lure and a host volatile lure inside. And you put those up. If you really want to catch them, you put them up in the highest part, sun exposed part of the crown in a tree. CFA get them up as high as they conveniently can, about five meters max with a pole and uh, as shown here. But if that's sitting in the shade, we've shown in research and others have that in the same tree, if you put that trap way up high in the sun, you'll catch significantly more EAB than the ones down here. But these are the surveys here that CFI have done with, they've done or their partners have done in Nova Scotia. Some of these traps would be put out by the um, uh, Nova Scotia Department of Lands and Forests. All of the green triangles are negative fines. So they've had a trap there, but they didn't find the EAB. Where there's red circles, that's where EAB has been found. So Moncton, Fredericton, Halifax, and uh, here's the shot of New Brunswick, Edmonston, a little ways down from Edmonston in in, uh, in Siegas, the Fredericton area, Moncton, the Fredericton area includes Sora Moncton. So all of those, unless it's got a red dot, it was a negative fine. So most is showing negative, but I will say that unless you have that trap within about 30 meters of an infested tree, it's probably going to be negative. <clears throat> so what to look for? Other thing you look for are signs and symptoms. Woodpecker feeding on the trees will, um, if they're if it's infested, really infested, they'll be lifting off the bark and making these patchy looking um, trees here. So you can look for that. It's a good sign. Um, on a really infested tree, you'll start to see also that's more woodpecker damage there. The crowns will thin, bad looking crowns here, and you get splits and you know in the bark underneath there's usually galleries. If you peel off the bark and you see this sinusoidal gallery, you'll pretty well know for sure you've got EAB. Um, I've seen heavily infested trees and I cannot find the D-shaped exit holes, but if you do see those, they're fairly um, here you can see the, the beetle poking its head or about to poke its head out of a hole. I actually have seen that um, up in Edmonston, but it, it's not that easy to see. The other thing are epicormic shoots. The trees, when they're stressed, they'll start, you know, these sort of dormant buds at the base of the tree will become undormant and you'll get this kind of look. Now this, this poster is put out by University of Nebraska with what they call EAB lookalikes. I don't think hardly anything on there looks like an EAB except for a few over here like this guy or whatever. But, um, you know, some people, if it's green and shiny, uh, an insect, they, they think it's EAB. It's best if you, you know, if you're not sure, let's see if I know if you think you find EAB in an area where it's not yet known. So how do you manage for it? Well, what CFA does is they do use regulatory controls to try to, you know, basically use the law to restrict artificial movement, restrict movement by people 
to kind of reduce the rate of spread. And it works to a, to a certain extent. It's kind of an uncontrolled experiment because you don't know how far it would have spread if you hadn't put that in. But it's difficult to um, to keep track of everybody moving firewood, that's for sure. Um, basically, when the EAB is infested in a city, the city's got some choices. They can use chemical control. There are a couple of products registered that you can inject into the tree. Imaget is a midacloper, that's a neonicotinoid. Triazin is the one that's used more commonly in Canada. It's a uh, botanical insecticide that's derived from the, the neem tree. So it's a naturally derived uh, from the, the seeds of the neem tree, this oil. It's an antifeedant and it's got insecticidal properties. You inject it into the tree. And it, um, as long as the tree was you know, in decent shape before you did it, they don't recommend treating a tree that's got 30% dieback because it won't bring it back. But any tree, um, that's, you know, it could be lightly infested or not infested in an area that is threatened to be infested and you can protect it about, you have to treat about every two years. It's a fairly expensive product, we'll say. The other thing that cities do and what they're doing in Halifax, they, the city council basically said, well, we can't afford to go, you know, to go and inject a ton of trees. So we're just going to basically cut down the trees that when they die, so they don't fall on people. And, uh, you know, we'll maybe kill some of the brood before the adults emerge. I will say that's one management method. The studies have shown that it's not very effective. Here's some of that study right here. They compared um, a few different ways of battling EAB, whether you reactively replace the ash. So if a tree is infested, you take it down and replace it with a tree species, or you proactively, you say, oh, EAB is coming. I'm going to take out all my ash trees and put another stuff. Or you try to control it with a, um, what they use down in the States is a chemical called amamectin benzoate every three years. In Canada, that would be like tree A's in every two years. And the study actually showed that you keep your trees, you keep your cities greener and it costs less if you use the systemic insecticides. <clears throat> this is an experimental treatment, auto dissemination of fungal pathogen. The idea is you put up a trap that you can normally use for monitoring insects, and these green funnel traps shown in the picture are, um, they're commonly used for longhorn beetles and used by CFA to detect other woodborne beetles that may be arriving in Canada from uh, Asia or Europe. And uh, instead of capturing them and killing them and counting them, you put a little chamber at the bottom of the trap, seen here, and inside that chamber is a pouch that has a bunch of spores of a very common um, fungal pathogen called Bolvaria bassiana, which was isolated in this region from a uh, from uh, another bark beetle. And you allow the, the, em the emerald ash borer to escape. And the idea is you hope that it will come into contact with a bunch of more EAB, either through mating, because it will try to mate more than once, and infect those beetles and reduce your adult population and thereby reduce the number of eggs laid. And there are some indications that it well definitely it infects about we've done experiments it'll affect the boat 35 to 40 percent of the eab adults in the area and um so half of those are females we know that an infected eab female doesn't live as long doesn't lay as many eggs so theoretically we're reducing the um the egg lay but we're still um having to sample to make sure that we're actually reducing infestation levels in those areas Here's another way is breeding resistant trees. And I think this is a very good way. It's going to be a long term goal, but I think this is the way to go. Um, they're trying to hybridize native ash with the resistant Manchurian ash. They're also looking for those ash trees of green ash, black ash, white ash that have survived EAB infestations and getting those into breeding programs. And another very important thing is conserving the ash genome. So Donnie McPhee at the National Tree Seed Center in Fredericton at the AF AFC lab. Um, he's going out and, uh, and his crew are trying to collect as many ash seeds as they can from white ash, green ash, and, and black ash in the Maritimes and get those into storage to conserve that those genes before EAB uh, gets in and wipes them out. And then hopefully in, you know, down the road, they can be reintroduced maybe when biocontrols and other controls are more operating. So this brings you to the last one is classical biological control. And that is introducing natural enemies that come from the pests native range, in this case, Asia, into North America and trying to get them to establish 
to provide some of that top down control. Some of the people that are responsible for the EAB biocontrol program in Canada shown here. Barry Lyons is retired now. Gene Jones is just about to retire. Uh, so is Chris Terrell. Chris McCory, fortunately, is still carrying on and he's leading it from CFS and Sault Ste. Marie. Corey Hughes is a technician in my lab and Corey's been doing all of the releases of the Emerald Ash Borer Natural Enemies in uh, the Maritimes since we started doing it about three years ago. This is a really long-term investment, but biocontrol, when it works, classical biocontrol is one of the most cost-effective pest management uh, tools out there. So there's a lot of a lot of agencies involved, um, including USDA Agricultural uh, Service, APHIS, and the Forest Service, CFS provinces, and whatnot. Now I will say that there are there are native North American parasitoids that have adapted to attack EAB. Um, a couple shown here, um, but they tend to be associated with declining populations of EAB. They haven't been effective at all at preventing EAB from killing 90% of the trees in the area, but they're hoping that they, you know, there has been some research done to see if they can be integrated into control programs. But the ones we're really talking about here are these species here. There's another one I'll begin to mention. Um, Spathius agrilli is one that they in have introduced in the States now for a while. We found out it doesn't survive well above 40 degrees um, uh, uh, latitude, so it's it's not been introduced into Canada. Um, this other one, Spetheus galenae, a cousin of this, another species in the same genus, it's from the Russian Far East. It matches our climate better, and it's been released in Canada since spring 2017. The main workhorse is this one on the far right called Tetrasticus planipanisi. It's been released in the States since 2009 and in Canada since 2013. And, uh, <clears throat> and then there's these two. Um, the one on the right has not been released yet. It's just undergoing lab testing. Um, all of these creatures, before you release them, you have to do quite a, a very thorough um, lab testing in quarantine facilities to make sure it's they're not going to attack, um, become a pest on you know, species we don't want them to kill. You know, they want to determine they don't have significant non-target non impacts before they've been released. So the homework's been done on this one on the left, Ubius agrilli. It was first released in Canada in 09, and, and sorry, in US in 09, in Canada in 2015. That's an egg parasitoid. So this is a much magnified picture. This tiny wasp does goes from egg to adult inside the egg, which is blobby thing on the, uh, the right-hand side of that left picture, the egg of the EAB. So the review process is quite stringent. You have to write a petition to CFIA. It goes to a couple of different committees of experts that review all of your data to see, you know, why do you want to do it? Is it safe? What not? So you have to have, you know, why do you want to do it? Well, EAB is killing all our ash trees. Okay, tell me all about your target pests, what it's actually doing. Is it having an impact? Tell me all about your proposed control agents. This is the most important here. Tell me. What's the whole specificity, specificity testing results? Have you tested it in choice and non-choice tests against all these other things that it might attack? All that homework was done in the States on these guys. What are going to be the environmental economic impacts if you release it? And how are you going to assess that? So if it's if it's approved, then you, you still need permits for bringing it in and all this stuff. And then you may have provincial, like New Brunswick and Ontario, have additional processes they want to see environmental impact statements done or analyses done on this. This is a picture of the mass rearing facility in Brighton, Michigan, which has provided most, well, all of the uh, agents released in the state so far, and a lot of the ones in Canada, very kindly. We also have our own rearing facility attached to CFS in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and they've been rearing Planipanisi and, and Obius grilli. Spathius glenae still come from the states. So now some data. This is where Tetrascus planipanisi has been released in Canada since 2013. Those are the numbers. So several thousand have been released so far in all of these sites, including in the Maritimes, Siegas, New Brunswick, Fredericton just last year, and Halifax just last year. And the work done by uh, Chris McQuarrie and his colleagues has shown that Tetrascus has established in a number of these sites. We'll be going into, Corey will be going into uh, New Brunswick and Siegas to see if it's established up there this year, coming uh, summer. The egg parasitoid has been released also uh, 
in all these places in Canada. Uh, trying to determine if you know if it's established is a lot more difficult, so that is ongoing. We don't know yet. And Spathias Gleanae is the most latest one. It's been released in these sites, but you can see all three have been released in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia so far. So the impacts of them on EAB, there's been more of that work's been done in the states. Um, it's difficult to show, but they, um, I mean, so far it hasn't prevented large-scale mort ash mortality, but they do, they are establishing, and it does appear to be having an impact, especially the one on the left, Tetraskis planet Panisse, um, looking like it is having a significant impact on the EAB, but it's too early to assess these other ones yet. So to summarize, and I hope I didn't blast you that too fast, I think I was talking fast, EAB is an invasive beetle from Asia that has killed millions of ash trees in North America. Surveying your ash stands will help you detect EAB as early as possible, whether you do that with branch sampling or peeling. You can also girdle a tree and peel it. Uh, I didn't go over that one. Put up traps. You can protect your ash trees by stem injecting triazin or imaget every year or two. And um, if you've got an infested ash with more than 30% crown dieback, you should probably fell that and process it to kill the EAB before the adults emerge. That'll have some impact. The long-term control of emerald ash borer, um, we're hoping will be possible by the combination of classical biological control, so hitting them from the top down, preserving the ash genome and breeding ash resistant trees, uh, basically hitting them from the bottom up. And if you want more information on this, you can contact me. Um, or Ron Neville, uh, if you're concerned about uh, quarantine areas and whatnot. And that's it. I'll take any questions. Wow, thank you, John. That was really informative. I I thought I knew quite a bit about Emerald Ash Borer, but cl I clearly didn't know as much as I thought, honestly. <laughs> so not only was that great for me, but I'm sure that everyone else learned a lot. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute the attendees, and you guys can raise your hands again. and ask any questions to John if you would like. No such thing as, as, as a dumb question, you know, especially if you don't know much about EAB. So if you, anything you're thinking of, just fire away. There is one in the chat. OK, I'll look in um. the chat see if I can, or you can. Uh, for the species that are being released to control eradicate, when will they what will they eat when they've done their job? Okay, well, we're never gonna, it's, we're forever, we'll, I said, we'll never eradicate EAB, it's here to stay. You know, once once it's it's established, uh, a species is established like it has here, um, it won't be eradicated. I'm not saying you can't eradicate any invasive species, because if you, that's why we want to try to catch them as early as possible. That's why CFIA put up traps every year around ports, or any, any place where they think there's a, a high risk of um, some non-native insect that could be could become invasive landing. You want to detect it as early as possible while it's still in a very small area and the population is low. Then they can be eradicated, although it's still difficult. So uh, what we're hoping with the biocontrol agents is they will, you know, get those EAB populations down to a level where they're not just like attacking every single ash tree in an area and down to a more manageable population. So... That's the idea, you know, right? What the what happens right now is EAB gets into a site. They start out slow for the first three years, and then they hit this kind of period of exponential growth where you've got a lot more trees attacked. The trees become weaker. When the trees become weakened, that's when they go through the one-year life cycle, even if it's cold, because they, they, for whatever reason, they can develop faster in a tree with lower defenses. And you just have tons of EAB out there, and the trees just can't can't take it, so yeah. Is there currently a way to estimate EAB population density? Yes, I mean, you can um, you can get an idea, uh, a very rough idea from your trap counts to know, you know, like uh, more than just presence absence, you can say, I mean, if you get a whole lot on the trap, but you know, it's, it's a pretty rough correlation. The, um, the best way to do it would be to, you know, uh, there are a couple papers out there where you'd have to do a quite a bit of branch sampling on the trees that are infested to get an idea of the number of larvae per branch and then extrapolate from there. Okay. Um, what other insects or diseases that affect ash that may be similar to EAB? There is the ash 
Um, the red-headed ash borer, which is a longhorn beetle, Neocleitus acuminatus, is quite common, um, a common beetle to in, in the forest. But there's nothing out there that makes that, it's funny, there's no other agrylus species that attacks ash or makes that, that sinusoidal uh, pattern, the larval gallery. So you're not going to confuse that. Um, there's nothing that's similar like that to EAB. I will tell you, though, that um, that agrylus planipennis, that genus that EAB is in, agrylus, guess how many, I want you guys, guess how many species are worldwide in that genus alone? Just give me, you know, just think of something. No. Lauren, you have to say something, because at least, because, you know, you got the mic and that. I said 40, I don't know. 40, okay, good, okay. Oh, 14, I, I said 14. 14. Or 40. Okay, 14 or 40, 3,000. What? There are 33,000 3, species, at least, in that genus alone, and there's probably new ones yet to be discovered. This is the guy, um, the, actually, Edward Jendek, he lives in Slovakia now. He's retired from CFA. CFA hired him when EAB came in because he knew he was a worldwide expert, and so he worked at CFA for years in the 2000s when all this is going on. Now he's retired, but he's the taxonomist that his, you know, his whole life was working with the Gryla species, and he's described a bunch of them. So... That's when I. That's why I think, holy crap, if there are 3,000 species in that genus, and most of them are what they call kind of, they have, they're not host specific to one. They're kind of genera specific though. So we have EAB attacks ash, and the other ones, they might attack oak. So there's ones that attack oaks, there's ones that attack birch, and that. I figure there's got to be another one out there that could be just as bad as EAB, but on something like oak, or, or other trees that we like. So that's why we're trying to really improve how we can detect these agrylus species that might be, you know, accidentally inside a ship, inside some wood packaging or whatever, right? Because a lot of them are in wood. So just to let you know, we have a native species called bronze birch borer called, and it's agrylus anxious is its Latin name. It's not a big deal here in North America if our birch trees are healthy. If you have a big drought period or a high stress, they will infest birch trees and kill them. But if they get into a European birch, they wipe them out like just like EAB wipes out our North American ash. So bronze birch borer would probably behave just like EAB if it got established in Europe. That's why Europe is really afraid of it. And yet the only agrylus species for what we know we have a pheromone for is emerald ash borer. We don't have good tools for detecting these things yet. So I'm going, you know, I've got way off on a tangent there because that's the other part, other lot of stuff I work on. But I'll get back to your questions here. Okay. One of the good questions that I'm interested in is how did they arrive in North America? Oh, I think I know the answer. Yeah, oh, they probably, they would have arrived in wood packaging probably because before they, you know, um, anytime you're packing a container or even the hull of a ship with um, usually heavy things like say marble or stone or uh, pumps or machine parts, or whatever, it's packed in wood, either on pallets or it's packed with a stuff called dunnage, which are chunks of wood. Before, they brought in, I mean, now there are rules saying that all that stuff has to be heat treated or fumigated before you can use it. People can still break the rules, but most of the audits show that less than 1% of the of the wood packing material is untreated or potentially infested. Now, actually, if you convert that into, if you see, you know how many millions of containers move around the world every year, that's still tens of thousands of containers that could contain insects. So we're still going to be getting them. But back before about 2000 and I think, three or 2005, all that stuff was not regulated at all. So you could tap the crappiest. I know guys in Victoria, these scientists, they were driving by a marble, a, a place that I think they made tombstones and they were unloading a, a container and they saw these big chunks of Norway spruce being taken out of this container. It'd be like Norway spruce with bark on that had been put in there just to, this was just back in about, I think it was maybe 2001, 2002. And they stopped and said, hey, you guys mind if we have a couple of those chunks of wood? The guy said, sure, we don't care. They took it to the lab and they reared 44 brown spruce longhorn beetle out of one chunk of wood. So out of one chunk of wood, you could get 44 beetles. EAB, you can get huge numbers coming out of a single tree when it's at that peak period of, you know, like when you peel the bark off and see all those galleries connected, you can get hundreds coming out of a single tree. So it probably came over in, in a infested wood from Asia. I wouldn't mind hearing uh, John Doblestein ask the question, is getting any slightly more resistant native ash trees and helping them establish new local area recommended? 
I know as a watershed organization, we typically try to plant trees along our brain zones, and ash is one of those trees we used to plant. Now we're not planting them. So yeah. is there, you know, is there a slightly more resistant native ash that we can try to get more established? Well, there was the, according to some studies in Michigan, like blue ash, but I don't think it would grow here very well. It's kind of restricted to right, the southern, I think you can only find around Point Pelee in that. Blue ash does seem to be more resistant, almost along the level of Manchurian ash. So, but I don't, like I say, I don't know enough about the uh, the requirements of the tree. I don't think it would be a good, it'd be offsite here probably. Other than that, there's nothing really available right yet. White ash is less susceptible, um, but it would still end up getting hammered, you know? So, but I do, that is a good strategy. Once there are some native, uh, once there are resistant native ash trees identified and and then bred and tested to show that it's actual resistance and not just, you know, being lucky or whatever, then that'll, that will be a, a very good um, way. I don't think they're available yet though, because like in the States, there's just been a couple things published where they have identified trees in areas like around Detroit and, and that, um, Areas that have been totally hammered by EAB, and they found some living trees. So they have now taken those trees, and I think with rooted cuttings, or whatever, they're growing them in um, in breeding programs now. And then they'll they'll try to breed up a bunch of resistant trees. And hopefully, I don't know how long that's going to take, but uh, um, conventional tree breeding usually takes takes a fair bit, you know. But yeah, I, I wouldn't even hazard a guess. But and the idea is to do that in Canada as well. You know, uh, especially down around the Windsor area, if they, if they, you know, Chris McCory put out a call or a general call to anybody out there. If you're in an area that's been hit hard by EAB and you see some surviving ash trees, let us know because we want to come around there and see if we can get those into a tree breeding program. So it's, but it's sort of down the road. Um, okay, we manage campgrounds. Is there an agency we could contact to determine if EAB is present? The Oh, well, I mean, you know, if you, um, depending where your campground is, you could you could contact CFA and find out if the area you, you are in is regulated. I mean, that doesn't mean EAB is there. That just means that CFA found EAB on maybe either side of you and thought, you know what, we're just going to go by county. We found it in the county or we found it, you know, they even went wider than that for for. Basically, because they had it in Moncton, Fredericton, and Siegas, they said, you know what, it's it's all kind of in the big, we're just going to like regulate right down through there. So you can find that out. Other than that, you'd be pretty well have to, you could, um, you know, if you contacted Ron Neville, whose um, contact info was on the last slide there, and I can put it up again. Um, he manages the survey program for EAB. And if you're in an area that they want to survey, um, he could. He, he might even provide you with some traps. He can do that sometimes. You know, I was just going to so. jump in on that, John. Um, it's Kristen. Um, oh, hi, Kristen. And we, yeah. um, we did some work with kind of a cases. They, we, last summer, we worked with partners to install some emerald ash borer traps at different locations that we got mm -hmm. from CFIA. So if you're interested in potentially having one of those traps and you and you have ash in those campgrounds that you mentioned, that's something that we could explore um, next summer if um, we're looking to do that project again. Okay, great. Thanks, Kristen. That's a great answer there. Yeah. Oops. Okay. I somehow just lost the chat there. but So there's a question here from Ben. Is chipping brush from trees significant to eliminate spread from insect infected and removed trees and how about larger wood chipping is yeah they, there were chipping studies done the first time they did them they found like if you use like basically if you use uh your standard wood chipper like a bandit or one of those ones that really you know it, it kind of it's got a spinning drum and it's whacking it with these sort of teeth and stuff that will usually kill everything in there um even if it doesn't actually strike them directly the centrifugal force is um when they bash around and there is enough to kill um, the EAB. If you're using something like a tub grinder, that doesn't necessarily get everything and you pretty well have to, you know, because you don't have those forces. Um, you might have to like screen stuff and put larger material back through again. I think, and I'm sorry, I'd, I'd have to look it up. I don't remember if CFI, they probably accept chips as long as they're of a certain size and uh, you know, be done properly. I'm not. I'm just not sure. But chipping, I know from things like brown spruce, longhorn beetle, and, and EAB, 
it's it really reduces the risk of having anything live emerge from that. Um, yeah, and one of the and we we actually have been trying to get to the bottom of this question too, and we work with with Ron at CFIA um, for people who want to know like what the best practice is. You know, we have our um, not sure if they have it in the Sussex area, but you know, you have your your yard waste cleanup at in the fall where you can just bundle sticks and stuff like that. So we are saying if you can burn it on site, do so. If you can use it on site, do so. Um, but if you can't, the smaller the better. Um, and Yes, chipping it particularly, but um, you know, I actually my mom sent me a photo in Ontario um, of one of those tiny little epicormic shoots, and it actually had a, a larvae in the shoot as well. So um, it can be quite small pieces of wood that still um, harbors these guys. Um, yeah, I know you. I know you're right, and you can have. That's why. Um, I mean, nursery stock stuff. Nursery stock. That's. And I forget how small diameter was, but you know basically stock that you're going to be moving from one nursery to another or selling somewhere and moving that, um, that can contain live EAB, you know, so maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, three centimeters diameter, a stem or whatever. So yeah, like you say, they will start up in the branches and then go down. They just need a thick enough phloem to, um, you know, for the larvae to feed in. So, so yeah. um, we'll just have this one last question and then we'll move on to the last presentation. So the question is, how do you determine whether the parasitic wasp has established in the areas they've been released? Okay, yeah, we haven't done that yet here, but basically what you do is you, you um, I've seen the protocol, you, you basically have to go in, and before you, first of all, before you even release it in an area, the site, you have to select a site where there is, there is an infestation of EAB, and there's sufficient numbers of infested trees in there that the parasites, have you know eab to attack and that and so you go in there the idea is if you've got that and you know the site's not going to be um mowed down you know the trees aren't going to be cut in the next couple of years or whatever or all treated with insecticide then you release the parasitoids for about three years and then go in and you're going to have to collect some you know you have to cut a few trees down get those bolts bring them back into the lab and see if you see what you rear out. If you only rear out EAB, then they didn't establish, you know, so you want to rear out the parasitoids out of ash trees from the site at which you release them. Um, for the Uobius, for the egg parasitoid, it's tougher. For that, I think they have to go in and, and, uh, and put out like basically sort of, you know, little patches of EAB eggs and see if they get attacked and stuff. So that's why it's a little bit trickier. But for the larval parasitoids like Tetrasicus and Spathius, you know, you will those will emerge from the the uh, branches or bolts of chunks of the trunk that you cut thank you so much john that was a lot of great information a lot of great questions from our audience tonight so i think we're gonna head on to the next presentation the final one and okay. just thanks again for all the great information you're welcome I think and i yeah presentation was a hit well, you're welcome. I'm glad. I'm yeah. I'm I'm glad. I just didn't. You know, I'm glad you didn't hit me for being so late and forgetting not to be on there on time. I came. I came in to sit down on my computer. Maybe I'll go and start writing that letter of reference. And I thought, oh crap! I'm at, I totally forgot about the meeting. And then I'm like, anyways, anyways, you're welcome. Happens to everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I am the last presentation for tonight for the Cannabicasis Watershed Restoration Committee. So is the correct screen showing? Can someone answer me? Yep. yep. Awesome. So for the last presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the terrestrial invasive species and the work that the Cannabicasis Watershed Restoration Committee has completed. And tomorrow I'll be doing the aquatic invasive species. So I'm Laura and I'm the invasive species coordinator here at the KWRC. And quickly, I'd like to thank DFO for making all this invasive species work possible here in our organization. Since we are a nonprofit, we go off provincial as well as federal and other organizational funding. So today I'm going to bring you through our educational as well as outreach plan, database and mapping on monitoring and management 
efforts and then what we hope to complete in the future. So not only do we want to focus on public education, we also want to make sure we educate our staff. So in the future, we'll be doing this by creating a field ID book so that whenever we are out in the field, we are able to pull out these little booklets and ID any invasive species in the area so we can do this when we're at restoration sites, when we're just out and about or if we're surveying different areas, as well as we were doing some stream bake surveys earlier this year and AID book would have been very helpful for some invasive species that we saw along the way. And we want, also want to introduce kind of like a training day or a little training booklet for our new seasonal or contract staff. So we can include our most identified invasive species in the watershed and get our staff the knowledge of what we have done and what we're doing so that they can then spread this awareness when they're in the field and then how they can reduce the spread while they're at work. So after kayaking, make sure there's no stragglers, as well as after we're going into a natural area, we have no hitchhikers. And so that they are safe in the field when they come across some of the species that can be harmful. So for our public education, so far we've been educating mainly through social media. So that would be our Facebook and Instagram page. You can follow us there keep up to date with everything that we're doing, as well as through our watershed walk videos on YouTube. And currently we have a Eurasian water milfoil presentation up. And then we also wanna do outreach days, which we have done in the past. So this would be at Fish and Bee Day we've attended as well as some farmers markets. And then we are currently working on the development of our website to have an invasive species tab. So for the website, we're going to focus on just a few species since there are 72 invasive species and that would make for a very overwhelming website. So we're just going to focus on the prevalent ones in our watershed that are easy to identify and pose the most threat to our watershed. So each little species will have a profile, so an introduction section how to identify them, how they are spread, their impacts, their social, economical, and environmental, what you can do about it, and then some other resources like educational documents, fact sheets, some management documents, as well as other websites that may have more information or have a greater amount of invasive species like the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council website, which they are currently developing as well. So for our current invasive species for terrestrial wise, we're going to focus on these four present species, which are spread across the watershed. So glossy buckthorn is the first one. And this one is a small tree and it usually takes over the understory of a forest and crowds out native vegetation. And then our next one is woodland angelica. And this one is related to giant hogweed although the effects of its toxic sap are not as damaging. So what happens is the sap gets on you and it reacts with the light to cause dermatitis. So cause burdening of the skin. And then Japanese knotweed, which was first introduced through the horticultural trade and can be found sometimes at some greenhouses or landscaping companies. Although you got to look out for it because it will take over just like Kristen's presentation, she sewed you a backyard. It will take everything in its way. And we have found this within our riparian zones along Trout Creek while doing some other sampling. And last on the right is wild parsnip, which is related to woodland angelica and giant hogweed. And this also has a toxic sac, which sap, which causes dermatitis when exposed to sunlight. And the main difference between these two is that wild parsnip has the yellow flowers and woodland angelica has the white flowers. And on our website, we will also be including the two species that are approaching. So as John had mentioned, emerald ash borer 
is located all around our watershed in Moncton, Fredericton, and or Muncto, and it is devastating to the ash population. And then also, as Kristen mentioned, Phragmites. We are unsure if this is within our watershed. I've only begun determining what's in our watershed since the fall, so I haven't been able to totally explore everywhere yet, but I haven't come across it. But we're pretty sure it's most likely here, but we haven't had any for sure sightings. And it usually takes over places that have moist soils or has shallow standing water. So like ditches or along um, wetlands. So for our database and our mapping, we have recently just started this in the fall of 2021. So with this, we want to be able to identify areas of concern as well as what species we actually have within our watershed. And this will be a continuous effort. So on the top left, that is currently our map. And as you can see, there's not very many points on it, but that's because we just started, but we're hoping to continue to grow our database through the summer. And this is using Google Maps. And we also have an Excel sheet with more information on it that characterizes the areas. And of course, the different colors means different species. And all this was just found doing our regular field work. There was no specific day that we went out just to search for invasive species. This was just what we ran into along the way. And we use GPS points while we're in the field and then we transfer them to the Google Maps. And through Google Maps, we attach information like the date, location, the species, the density, the population, the life stage of the plant, as well as any other notes that we deem important. And we are also using iNaturalist, which is the lower left picture. And this way we are able to have citizen science involved and really interact with the public. So if they find any spots of, say, Japanese knotweed, we are able to just search for Japanese knotweed and all of the locations of the sightings will pop up. And we're also able to use certain projects like the NBISC project that they are doing. And this really gives us the ability to cover such a large landscape with more people rather than just the five employees we currently have right now who we sometimes get into the watershed but this really gets everywhere that even places we can't reach so now i'm going to talk about a past management or opportunity that we had with unb students so in fall of 2020, all the way to spring in 2021, we worked with the environment and natural resource students at UMB during their capstone project. So we contracted out a project for them to complete for us. And what we wanted them to do was to identify the impact of emerald ash borer on our water quality, as well as riparian health, and kind of determine the population of ash with Trout Creek. And the reason why we focused on the Trout Creek watershed is because we know there's an established ash population there within the riparian zone. So through their work, they conducted a lot of field work as well as a survey. So they identified ash trees within riparian zones in the sub watershed, and they conducted the survey to determine what management options stakeholders were willing to do on their own property since Trout Creek along the water there. It's a lot of private land. So a lot of homeowners or cottage owners have that land. So we wouldn't be able to apply management just to ourselves. We'd need permission. And we were also, well, UNB was also determining what knowledge the residents had of Emerald Ash Borer prior to the survey. And what they found was that the ash trees were set back in the riparian zone. So they were greater than 10 meters or 30 meters. So they had little impact on water quality, which means that they had a little impact on temperature, canopy cover over the river, erosion, bank stability, and nutrient cycling within the water. 
which is a good thing. So if ML dashboard does come through, there'll be little impact on our riparian zone. And UMB for what they defined was the riparian zone was more of a buffer zone. They surveyed up to 30 meters from the water. And through this, they also determined that a lot of the landowners are open to management and they are very keen to learning more about Emerald Ash Bar. And through all that, we were able to come up with a management plan. So they delivered us with a monitoring plan, which involved using traps so we can use early identification, an education plan and information that we can create different outreach materials. And then they gave us a specific management plan, which we were able which we are able to use. And the idea that they came up with was to have a set of parameters. So it's almost like a dichotomous key where it used densities as well as species richness to determine the vulnerability of the area to emerald ash borer. So the amount of ash trees within a certain area. So this way we were able to give the best site prescription of management combinations. So for monitoring emerald ash borer, we did do some last year in the summer of 2021. We had partnered with the MBISC who provided us with three traps. So we were able to do three locations throughout our watershed. We did two locations along the Trout Creek watershed, as well as one in Quispamsis. And we deployed the traps in June and then collected them in August. And we did not identify any emerald ash borer within our region at those locations. But we did have one suspicious looking bug, but it ended up not being emerald ash borer, which we had sent to a professional to get identified. So it's hopeful right now, but we want to make sure that we continue to look for it so that we can catch it right away. So if so, we can try and isolate an emerald ash borer outbreak, or we can start implementing management. So here's a few photos from what we used and what we did. So we used the prism traps that John had mentioned, and we did have some bycatch, but none showing that we had EAB around these ash trees. And in the future, we would put them up for longer. We only had them out for a total of two months. Ideally, we should have got them out at the beginning of June, however, I don't think we, yeah, we didn't get the traps in time to put them out for the beginning of June. So for our future initiatives, everything for us depends on funding since we are a nonprofit. So as long as we continue to have funding through different funding agencies, we're able to continue our work with invasive species. However, without funding, there are still things that we can do to prevent our spread and educate the public. So we want to continue to partner with the New Brunswick Invasive Species Council through prevention, monitoring, management, education, and all that good stuff so that we can learn more and so we can teach everyone in our watershed about different ways to protect our environment. And then we also want to continue to spread awareness so we want to eventually hopefully put up some educational signs or caution signs where we have large populations of invasive species continue to develop educational outreach for our social media and continue to do some watershed walks continue to attend public events and we also want to grow our citizen science so hopefully with funding we'll be able to host bio blitz events where we go out into a region and a large amount of volunteers and we use iNaturalist to identify all the different species within the region and this way hopefully we can identify if we have any invasive species at say our restoration site or wherever we decide to host these events and we're also going to continue to grow our database and our mapping through iNaturalist, the BioBlitz, and just through continuous work in our watershed. And hopefully this year in 2022, we're able to get EAB traps again, fingers crossed, 
so that we can track the spread and so we can have early detection within the watershed. And hopefully in the future, we'll also have some funding to do some more management or come up with some management plans within our riparian area for Japanese knotweed and possibly buckthorn. And then we also want to hopefully be able to implement our EAB management plan that UNB provided us. And then we also want to try and create local partnerships with our greenhouses as well as different construction companies so we can educate and train their employees so that we can reduce the spread of invasive species and hopefully educate landscaping and greenhouses on what kind of impact invasive species have that they sell so different horticultural species has on our natural environment and so that they can also inform consumers but I'm just going to reiterate this all depends on funding, which hopefully we will have and we work hard every year to ensure we have funding for all the great things we do here at the Ken Cases Watershed. And that being said, I'd like to thank our funders. So DFO again for funding this project specifically. And then our other funders are listed who has allowed us to complete a lot of restoration work and tree planting, as well as some plastics surveys and different good stuff that will help us improve our watershed. That's awesome, Laura. Thanks a bunch. Um, I, again, uh, the KDBC is a nonprofit. Uh, we gear a lot of our effort uh, towards engaging volunteers, that kind of thing. Uh, and if you are interested, we, I encourage you to send us an email. Uh, you can email us at uh, info at cannabiscaseriver.org. Just let us know that you're interested in volunteering for some of our events. Uh, we do post on social media, Instagram, YouTube, and on our Facebook uh, or on our website as well. Uh, so if you're not following us there, I encourage you to follow us along there as well so that we can uh, basically, um, you know, recruit you to be a volunteer for our bio blitzes and stuff like that. And, I don't know about you guys, but I know that being out in the field and doing that kind of stuff is always rewarding. I'm always learning and, and finding new things that, you know, I didn't know before, new species, whether it be a bug or a plant or a fish or, or what have you. And it's always fun to kind of get that, you know, that new feather in your cap or, of ID. So that, that's awesome. Um, we're going to open it up for questions uh, for, for Laura or to myself, Laura, if that's all right. And, uh, but I, again, I, I do want to say, Laura said it, um, thanks to our partners at um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the Aquatic Invasive Species. Also, thanks to our presenters tonight, John and Kristen. Thanks a bunch. We couldn't do this without you guys and your expertise. And it's it's great when I can come on. I can host these events, but uh, then come on and still learn about, you know, all the things that uh, that I'm engaged in. So that's awesome when that happens for me. So I'm hoping that everybody has uh, an equally um, revealing or aha moment tonight that I, I had a couple of them so i'm hoping everybody else had one or two of those as well any questions uh regarding the kdbr and where we're heading uh in the next little bit feel free to either text it or or if you can unmute everybody that would be awesome yeah sorry i think it muted itself i don't remember um oh yeah i unmuted everyone verbally and i think the chat's working again i got a little notification saying everyone had been muted for some reason okay perfect thanks kristen uh, a great uh you guys are as equally a great a partner for us as we are for you i hope so um thanks a bunch for that comment we awesome. have a couple well, ideas that we're going to come knocking on your door tomorrow for <laughs> yeah well definitely and that and and, and that, that's what it's about is creating opportunities and ideas uh, along the various species obviously as a watershed group we do focus a lot on riparian and floodplain and aquatic species uh, but uh, where we really want to delve into other uh, educational opportunities outreach opportunities citizen science opportunities as well so definitely let's have that conversation um well, listen everybody i i I really want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, Laura, is there anything else as far as uh, things for tomorrow night? Um, no, if you can attend tomorrow, that would be great. We'd be much appreciated and we hope you learn a lot tomorrow if you do attend. If not, we will have a recording of that webinar as well up on our website. And great. just to, oh, um, we will have Megan Bruce and um, Lucas Rose to present on EWM and Willie Hemlock Adulgent. 
And then MBIC is also attending again, covering different information than they covered tonight. And we will also be covering different information tomorrow night. Yeah, so tomorrow night the focus was, is for the MBISC and for the Kittiburu Sea will be more so on the aquatic species or the waterborne species, more so than the terrestrial species that you learned about tonight. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming out and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Or a great job. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Connect you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kristen. Thank see you guys. Thanks. Kristen, we'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you, guys. It'll actually be Shelby tomorrow. Okay. Um, do you want to give us a call tomorrow morning, maybe, and have a quick conversation, just a compression? Sure. Yep. Perfect. I'll talk to you then. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Emily. Hopefully you enjoyed it and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night. Tessa, same thing. Claire, thanks.